Welcome to episode one of the Animals Everywhere podcast. Today I am joined with Israel Spruch, aka Izzy. So Izzy is the founder of Crocoholics Conservation Center, a center that works with rare and endangered crocodilians and has successfully produced West African dwarf crocodiles. In this episode we go into detail on how exactly to breed these endangered animals and all the personal tips Izzy has discovered. So get a pen and get a pad. This is going to be a good one. A few things to keep in mind. Crocoholics Conservation Center is located in South Africa, which is in the Southern Hemisphere. So the winter and summer months will be different to that of the Northern Hemisphere. Having said that, we use Celsius as a temperature reading, not Fahrenheit. So for instance, the water temperature for your West African dwarf crocodiles must be 32 degrees Celsius, which is approximately 89.6 degrees Fahrenheit. You stoked? I'm excited. You're listening to Animals Everywhere, a podcast that aims to inspire each and every one of you to make an impact and be the change. Learn more about our natural world. Explore the lives of those wild and wonderful. My name is Bryce Broom, and I'm best known for my infatuation with wildlife and to live a wild life. So welcome, Izzy. This is officially my first podcast. Thank you so much for coming out. I really appreciate it. No, no, it's awesome, man. I'm quite stoked to actually be here. Only quiet. Well, I'm Come stoked, on. bro. Like, like it's pretty first, cool. Yeah. First interview. Okay, cool. So today we're going to be talking about West African dwarf crocodiles, Osteolamus tetraspis. Yep. It's gonna be dope. So I wanted to start off with like, how did you get into these so-called unloved animals? Okay, so that's actually quite an interesting question. Um, when I was a kid, dude. Yeah. Um. I was obsessed with dinosaurs, like most reptile people always say they are. I, yeah, yeah. I was totally obsessed with it. And it was so difficult for my parents to actually get me dinosaur stuff in that. Okay. And Why then, weren't there dinosaur toys there back in the olden days? There wasn't, you? dude. Like there wasn't. Like McDonald's had this whole thing with skeletons, but anyway. Well, you're not that old. I was just teasing. <laughs> it's fine, man. Um, so, yeah. So I got into reptiles from dinosaurs and I got a first snake at like... Six years old, my parents bought me a corn snake. Okay. And it was pretty cool. Like, I really enjoyed it. And I always said I want I want crocodiles. Like, I really want crocodiles. We used to go to Sun City and I used to go and look at the crocodiles. And I'd be like, one day I'm going to have a crocodile. It's going to be freaking cool. And slowly but surely, I worked hard and I worked hard. And I always wanted crocodiles. And then Mike Bester brought in some dwarf caiman. Okay. And he wasn't allowed to sell them to the public so i struck a deal with a, a zoo that okay. they took two and i got one and which I paid, dwarf crocs i uh, mean dwarf came in the curvias curvias dwarf palisucus pulpobrosus okay and so i made this deal with him that i'll pay for all three okay and i'll get one if he buys them and he didn't really want them so he did it and i got my one and his name was ice cream Oh, nice. It was freaking cool. And I raised that. And then all of a sudden, like, crocodiles just became my thing. I wanted more crocodiles. Because of the, like, dinosaur factor to them. Because yes. they look, like, so prehistoric. They're so prehistoric. Especially if you look at, like, where dinosaurs come from. I know two its horrors are, like, related to dinosaurs. Yeah. But I don't have... <laughs> capability of getting a tuatara tree. so i don't think many people crocodiles do. are cooler and then the whole palasuchus thing it was like so similar to a dinosaur even if you look at their latin name palasuchus which yes. is like pal old and when i did some research on them i discovered they one of the most unevolved crocodilians palasuchus palasuchus yeah so okay. they form part of the ancient crocodilian morphs okay and that that was pretty cool, you know. They're so, such an unchanged crocodilian species. It's almost so like, almost like the closest thing you can get, get to an actual dinosaur. Dinosaur is a Palasuchus, and it was just pretty cool. Like, but if you want to go truly into what got me into the unloved, I was like a very bullied kid that no one okay. cared about, and I just found passion in reptiles because they know. like the unloved. Yeah, the I unloved, feel- and I felt. I felt at home with reptiles. Yeah, I felt. I feel the same. Like that's why I love. I don't know, the unloved dogs to rottweilers, snakes, uh, reptiles that people really are afraid of and don't actually like. So it's like kind of like we put there to show everybody, hey, these animals are pretty cool. We must yeah. learn to love them. No, 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 definitely. It's like the whole thing of you, you dislike what you don't understand. 
Yeah. And I feel like I've got a purpose in life is to show people that they can understand these animals, that they can understand. I had a chat with a friend of mine today and we said snakes have personalities. Yeah, so true. And you look at it and you really, really want to know more about it. I, uh, for example, squamageras were yes. the example. And we're chatting about it and I said, how come you get some psychotic ones that just want to bite you and mess you up? Yeah. And then you get such chilled ones, you know? Yeah, and squams, a- for those of you who don't know, are West African uh, variable bush vipers, excuse me, not West African. Um, <laughs> but yeah, they're some of the most common athera species. They're really cool, but yeah, f- feisty, as you were saying. They are nasty little some of them can be like little de- devils literally yeah and then some of them can be so chilled and laid back and it really got me thinking like these personalities between animals yes and if you look at crocodiles for example that's that's my favorite thing you know <laughs> i just want to talk about crocodiles but they have such unique personalities i can, you can see it in american alligators so alligators are very common you know yeah. they kept and you'll notice on these wild animals, like you watch Gator Boys and that, they're so aggressive and everything. And yes. then I think the guy's name is Chris Gillett. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, from Gator Boys. Yeah. Uh, it is Gator Boys, right? I don't know. I don't think he's from Gator Boys. Uh, he works at, what's that institute? I don't know. With Nicole, is his girlfriend who also like... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I know who you're so talking about. So he catches all these or gets these problem gators and he okay. trains them. And they become so awesome, like Casper, one of yes, his. Yes, I remember and one of the most famous. Tame, yeah, and it's so tame and so understanding. And then if you look at the pet hobby, people buy alligators, they buy these little babies and they're cute and that's why they buy them. Yes. And, and they then they big. just become real, lack of a better word, assholes. Yeah, big you know? dinosaurs that are... Aggressive. Yeah. And I think that's part of the personality thing that uh, crocodiles have. Yes. You can get animals that are super aggressive and super chill and super laid back. But if you put in the training, you'll still have an aggressive animal, but it'll listen to you. It'll understand you. So do you think it's more of an animal that maybe not aggressive like naturally, but it's because the owners haven't put in the time and the effort to actually desensitize, for lack of a better word, these animals? Yes, I would say so. I would say so. I still think you would get an aggressive animal. Okay. But it would be tame to its keeper. Yes. Well, yes, not yes. tame. Tame is a, a, a terrible word to use. More socialized with humans. More yes. human tolerant. Yes. Tolerating our behavior uh, rather than becoming like a pet and so-called tame. Yeah. So it's like, it's hard to say. But for example, alligators, they say, are one of the most intelligent crocodilians. Really? Yeah. They, they say that, that that in Cubans. Okay. Cuban crocodiles. Yeah. Well, uh, those things are mean Crocodilians from fiery. Bifa. Yeah. Yeah. But they, they train really well and they're very okay. intelligent. And then what I thought was quite interesting is I hatched out these uh, osteolamus, yes. the dwarf crocs. And everyone said, no, dwarf crocs are so aggressive. You'll never be able to train them. Yes, yeah. And then I, I hatched out this one and his name was Gummy. And I still got him. Oh, he's the cutest guy ever. Yeah. And he, he comes when I call him. If I say rock, he goes onto his rock and... He, when, when he was a hatchling, I used to put my hand into like the tank. Yes. And I'd say, love nibbles, love nibbles. And obviously he came to check if it was food. He didn't really care that I was saying <laughs> love nibbles. But he would test by biting my hand very, very soft. Okay. Like almost like a gentle nip. To test if test it's test food. if it's food. Wow, and that's incredible. he wouldn't be aggressive towards me. And I've continued training with that animal. And we have a bond, should I say, between that animal yes. and me. Yes. And everyone said you can't do that with dwarf crocs. So I'm just saying all crocodilians are trainable. Even your gnarls, your yes. nylosticus. If you put in the time and the effort, you will get... Yeah, some may be that- harder than others, but they all have the capability if you, as you said, put in that effort because and that's, that's what, what counts. That's what makes them so lovable in the sense <laughs> of an unloved animal, but it can really show affection to a certain degree. Like David Attenborough said, many people think of reptiles as stupid, dim-witted, and um, I can't remember what the final word he used, but they can be surprisingly fast, lethal, and affectionate. That's so true. And they do have their own personalities, like you were saying. Each individual is so drastically unique. different and unique, just like the, the snakes in my like room. So many of them are like the Cape Cobras, for instance. Mm -hmm. They're supposed to be pretty mean and agitated snakes. But the male over there is 
the, he's kind of like they're both spying on you yeah he is uh. he's like he's kind of like a corn snake as you can see he doesn't hood you can try make him hood he's not gonna do anything whereas the female who's right by your hand she will hood <laughs> right there yeah obviously there's a cage between so don't space about that guys but yeah so i wanted to get into what is crocoholics about and what is it Okay, so Crocoholics was an idea I had once I started breeding the Osteolemus. And I thought, th- there's less than like a thousand wild Osteolemus. <laughs> I just missed coffee all over my shoulder. Oh, shop. darn. <laughs> <laughs> okay, keep going, yeah? So, yeah, um, there's less than a thousand Osteolemus in the wild. Okay. And that's, that's including the two subspecies. I think there's three now. Three subspecies? They, well, or they, no, they, they've elevated to full species. Okay. But they're trying to separate another one. So oh, there's two now. I didn't know about that. You get Osteolemus tetrapus tetrapus. Yeah. Well, it's now Osteolemus tetrapus. And then and you then get Osteolemus osborni. osborni. And then there's a third one that they're trying to... By the time I'm dead, there'll be 100 crocodiles <laughs> compared to when I started 22. Yeah, it's incredible. They're constantly splitting animals up. It's not like they're also like finding new species, but it's just they keep splitting, splitting up. Like with your forest copers, they're all one species. Now it's five different mm, things. It's intense. It's incredible. So, um, so Crocodilics Conservation Center is mainly focused on Osteolamus then? No, I want to focus on African crocodiles. Okay. But then I also want to extend it to like Cites Appendix 1 animals, animals that need help. Okay. And I've come to the conclusion of it that no matter what you do, if you add a monetary value to an animal, it's going to carry on. Yes. So my whole plan with Crocoholics was breed Osteolamus, get okay. get more Cites Appendix 1 animals, okay. breed them and give them to institutes or well, swap and trade between institutes. Yes, so that there's almost a captive... There's a captive population. Yes. Like a surplus of these animals. And I know we won't be able to ever release them back into the wild, but yeah. it would stop. It, the potential is there, though. The potential, just people, legislation. legislations and that stop it. Yeah. But if you carry on breeding these animals and making surplus, yeah, it, it'll be really, really awesome because there's more of them. And, and they the animals, don't need to be poached in the wild. They don't need to be exactly. removed. Now, Osteolamus are really rare because of the bushmeat trade. Yes, and not because of their hides, because they're obviously Osteolamus meaning. Yeah, the osteoderms on the yes. skin, yeah. so th- th- They're very th- bony, in other words. Yeah, so osteoderms are bones underneath the skin um, on top of the flesh, pretty yeah. much. And what's interesting about the Osteolamus, which the name refers to the four bones at the yeah. back of their neck, but their leather can't be used. Yeah. So it's merely meat that's causing them to reach this almost extinction. Yeah. But it's kind of a sad thing also because if you think about it, the the meat trade is also there because there are people there who are starving and kind of need food. So it's it's that's so, why we kind of need these animals to be yeah, bred in captivity, I guess. I suppose so. I mean, look, it, it's a very touch-and-go subject. But yes. if you could breed them and farm them in Congo and in West Africa and sell them real cheap, the meat, yeah, I'm pretty sure you could have a market for it and it would cause them to be farmed there. Whereas people aren't doing stuff like that. They, they're not concentrating on how to make the species more in captive situations so that the wild population is safe. Yeah. Imagine they could, you could buy Osteolamus meat. Yes. At the same price you're buying the wild caught animal that's tied up on the side. It stops the poaching. It stops the cruelty. Yes. It's so regulated. Then and then you've got all these animals. However, I don't want to feed crocodiles <laughs> to people. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's but not the ultimate that's not the, goal. Uh, the there. ultimate goal. But crocoholics is more so to save the species in a captive yes, way. Yes. I get that. Um, so, with having said that, let's jump straight into what the subject today is about and that is breeding osteolamus where yeah. Afri- well you you currently have both species right or two of the i have two of the species okay. um there's a bit of an argument whether or not but um for example osborne gets really big so i have a specimen mr truffles okay he's really 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 big like i've guys in europe have come to my house and seen him and they say, whoa, they've never seen Osteolamus that big. Yeah, he is huge. And so I started doing like more research on him. And then when I paired him with my one female, yeah, all of a sudden the juveniles looked so Osborne-y. That like orange, that yellow orange head. That orange color, 
brighter colors, whereas the West Africans are normally these dark, bland babies. Yes. And then you get the Osborne, which have these bright orange, yellow heads with the banding and that. And I got some juveniles out that looked like that. So I did some more research and I checked Mr. Truffles is potentially, there's no proof, I haven't done DNA testing. Yes, yeah. But he seems more Osborne than anything else. And then I've got obviously Tetrapus. Yeah, the breeding pair. The breeding of- pair, which I normally um, breed. Okay, so then now going into it that you, you kind of hope or you think you got both species now, that, that's really cool. Obviously, you need to find a female. I need to find a female or spawny, yeah. Because that'll be insane. Because believe it or not, Osteolamus aren't that easy to breed <laughs> and Izzy seems to have cracked that code. Like, yeah, I don't know. I'll, I'll tell you now. <laughs> Um, incubation is my biggest problem. So I've hatched out a few babies over the past three, four years. Yeah. And incubation has been my main problem. So I've figured it out now after last year and my incubator bombed out. So it couldn't really be mm. put to the test. But that sucks. I've got a technique. I'm getting them to breed. I'm getting them to lay eggs. I'm incubating the eggs and I'm getting somewhat success rate out of hatching. That, that's... That's insane because there are facilities all around South Africa that have breeding pairs and way more than you and they're unable to produce any viable offspring. So I think what you're doing is pretty special. No, no, it is. It is. And I I have to do this. I'm going to give a shout out to an American that gave me advice, um, Paul Bodnar. Okay. And he bred the Osteolamus back in the early 2000s. Yeah. And he just gave me some advice, you know, like on how to keep them and that. Because you can find nothing on the internet, right? Or books? Nothing, nothing. There's hardly any information. Actually, I've got a book, Crocodilians, Husbandry and Natural History. And there's there's a tiny little article on, I think it's page 363. Yeah. And it's literally just on Osteolamus laying eggs, the eggs hatching. And the guy who did it, the article's about, like it's literally a paragraph. Okay. He did in the whole book. Ac- in the whole book. And it's the only information I can find on breeding osteolamus. Yeah. He did it by accident. <laughs> what are the odds? He did it by accident. Okay. And then he just gave like what he incubated the eggs at. And he only had one viable offspring. Okay. Out of how many eggs? There were 16 know? eggs. Wow. So that, that hatch rate is pretty low. Yeah. And it was by fluke that he, he bred them. Okay. Um, but that article helped me a lot because it told me what temperatures he was keeping them at. Ooh. And like what an act accidents he made yes. that helped and it really did so the trial and error the trial and error was there so i used that and i used my friend paul and they with both their advice i sort of figured out a technique that works also googling like what the weather's like in west africa where yeah, they occur that's insane so because obviously they're also in these small little puddles because they're more of a terrestrial crocodilian, right? Yeah, so they they actually hold the record for the crocodile that wanders the most, should we say? That's so cool. So in the banana fields in West Africa, yeah, they often found them on the like roads and that miles and miles away from any water system. That's really intense. Like, uh, people don't think of a crocodilian as a terrestrial animal, more as an aquatic little guy, but I suppose mm. maybe that's why they need so much osteoderms and Protection. so much armor because they're wandering around so much. Perhaps. And also, they also noted as an arboreal species. That, that's freaking cool. <laughs> a crocodile, <that's, laughs> a crocodile that's, in a tree. They've been found 10 meters above the 10 ground. Meters. 10 meters above the ground. That's... So they literally climb up these trees, these like low, like there's a branch at an angle, yes. and they'll climb up that and rest there and bask there which is like what and when i hatched that out babies so cool. i was so shocked i put them in my fish tank it's a four foot fish tank these little babies and at about six months of age when they got started getting some size on them yeah they started climbing on the backgrounds of the enclosures and go bask like not even by the basking lamp they just lie <laughs> on top of the cage i remember that you sending me those photos saying hey look 
my crocs <laughs> climbed out the enclosure that's nuts because they climb and what's amazing is like if you watch them do it yeah the tail almost curls it's like not prehensile but it curls around to give them extra grip so that they can push themselves really? higher and higher that's insane and the slender snouts your um west african slender snouts and yes the, your mr stops cataphractus they've been recorded the same thing like really? so it seems and they're like much west, bigger they're much larger species but it seems like this west africa hmm. produces a boreal crocodile <laughs> i wouldn't say it's a boreal <laughs> yes. but it's I wonder it's if that's cool. the case with uh, Crocodilus sucus, your desert crocodile. Yeah, we, 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 I don't know. I've never kept them, but it would be quite interesting to check. To find out, yeah. We should try to see if we can find out any information about that. So let's let's go on to diet. How do, how important is diet for breeding Ooh. these crocodilians? Diet, diet, diet's very important. So you need a high calcium diet. Okay. And now a lot of people in um, from all over give me advice feed fish. Yeah. And I notice they don't like fish. Don't they? They don't like fish at all. Well, I suppose they're in these little puddles. How Where can you won't fish find fish. Occur? Yeah. But what they do like is crayfish, like crabs and that. But wow. what I found out feeding the best is I take a mouse, like yes. a rat, and I take beef bones. Okay. You know those round when you put in the soup? Yes. The yeah, hole yeah. in the middle? Yeah. And I put the, mouse the marrow in the marrow. Yes. Yeah. You push out the marrow and you push the mouse through and you put three bones around a mouse and you feed them that and the calcium boosts. It's much higher. Wow. If they don't have that calcium, what I noticed in my clutch in 2018, my eggs were soft. Okay. So that's the year that I discovered I need to give them more calcium. Yes. Yeah. So the eggs, when I pulled the eggs out the ground, yeah, they would crack. Oh, hectic. Just for a little bit of pressure on my finger. And I realized, no, that's calcium they, they need deficiency. calcium because obviously it's So I wonder working. what they would get them, the calcium from in the wild if I'm they I'm guessing eat. crayfish, like the crabs now because they've got those hard exoskeletons. I suppose so, hey? Because I've also seen it documented that they eat these like large West African centipedes and millipedes. I've seen that. That's like... Yeah, it's crazy. They're eating things that don't really have calcium, should we say, Yes. in their diet. But they breed in quite well. And they mound nesters. Yes. So they build this huge mound that, and then lay the eggs and deposit the eggs inside the mound and they protect it. But my question has always been like, in the wild, yeah. where are these mounds found? Like if they live in little puddle sections, yeah. where are they building these mounds? You know, Far from water or... Or close to water, yeah. Because when I breed them, my female sits outside her water, right on the mound. It seems like they don't go into the water at all when they're That's mounding. Crazy. So well, since that they are terrestrial, it could be true that they just they don't need water as much as other crocodilian species. That's incredible. And how often do you feed them then uh, so for we, like a proper diet? Proper diet. So juveniles, you'll feed pretty much every second day. You'll give them like a pinky okay. or a bit of mince meat, gizzards also work. You just dip it in that uh, crocodile. Um, Calcium, uh, vitamin stuff. The farms, they do this whole thing where they make like a fish meal supplement. Okay. And they mince up food and they mix it with that with that powder. Okay. And it gives them a boost because we can't get Missouri here in South Africa <laughs> where they actually make a proper crocodile pellet. Yes. So I feed them every second day as juveniles, but adults I feed twice a week. Okay. And when they eat, they'll eat a kilogram each in a sitting. Wow. For such a small For crocodile, a small species, that's I mean, they lot. weigh like 30 to 60 kgs. So that must mean they're moving around in the enclosure quite a bit to burn up yeah. all that excess meat. Yeah, pretty much. So they move around a lot. They're very, very active crocodiles. And then what size and age do these animals have to be to successfully reproduce? Do you know? Well, it's, it's a difficult argument because people say size pays a big difference to age. So if your crocodile is of a certain size, it should be able to breed. But if you can get that crocodile in three years to that size, it's still not going to breed. Yeah, I reckon it's not healthy then because you're power feeding you're the power animal. You're power feeding it. Fatty and, liver disease or whatever. Yeah, but it's not going to breed still. It okay. has to be a minimum of eight years old. Females have to be one meter okay. and males about 1.3. Wow. So the males are generally bigger than the females. females yeah. Sexually dimorphic. Okay. That's weird because um, last year in, I think it was September, I went out to a zoo down in KZN and we had to help the zoo train the staff how to like catch these osteolamus. And the female 
was way bigger than the male. The male was probably the um, just a bit smaller than your female, mm. or the same size. But that, that the, is interesting. The female was huge, almost just a bit smaller than Mister Truffles. That that's crazy. I wonder if she's actually Osborne. I wonder because we did uh, sex them there to like make sure this is the female and this is the male, and the female was definitely bigger, like by a lot. That that that's that's crazy. But it could also indicate why they they they're not really getting that breed. The male's too scared to go to the female because <laughs> she's so big. Okay, so that may make sense because they may be totally different species now that they've been reclassified. Yeah, pretty much. And if the male can't access that female she's aggressive towards him or yeah um and he's much smaller than her it's not like he can mate with her yeah and h- how important is it um like to set up the enclosure correctly for reproducing these animals it's quite important um so with my enclosures when i first started i just had like a two water systems okay so i had two little um puddles pretty much we'll call them puddles yes. but they're quite big puddles okay um and I noticed that that made a big difference because when I got my pair where they were being housed before, they just had one water system. So if they get annoyed with each other, they can go to separate water systems and stop fighting. Okay. They're very territorial species. Wow. They're very aggressive even towards each other. And does the amount of height in the enclosure matter? Yes. So I built when I built my enclosure, I put these logs and fake rocks now Okay. in the enclosure. And I'll notice they'll go sit on top of that. They'll go sit higher above the water. And if you walk into the enclosure in a, like you open the door really fast, yes. they'll scoot straight whoop, whoop, into the water and like. So do they do that to regulate themselves and get obviously the optimal uh, temperature, temperature? I imagine that's why they're climbing. But I think when they're hiding yeah. in the wild in a tree, they'll always be above a water system. Okay. Like even so if there's a puddle, an escape so there's route. an escape route. They can just go floop into Pretty the water. Pretty clever. <laughs> Pretty cool and clever. And the, as for temperatures of the water, temperature of the water is very important. So here in South Africa in Gauteng, we get very cold temperatures. Yeah. So my enclosure. Well, co- I, cold is relative. Yeah, yeah, America, yeah, yeah. <laughs> for, for America, for where Ostilamus, it's snow cold. In that, yeah. For Ostilamus, it's cold. Let's put it that way. Yes. So I built these greenhouses. So it's got polycarbonate sheeting across. Okay. Plus I heat my water. Yes. And it causes a big humidity and rays. Now, with the humidity, um, your your ambient temperature should be around 32 with a basking spot of 35. Okay. And then your water temperature never drops below 28. Even in winter? Even in winter. Yo. My water is at 32 in summer. That's, Same temperature as the like ambient. That's like a jacuzzi. Yeah, and they love it. And they, they eat every day and like that. And they really love that warm temperature. Okay, so it's very important. If it to... goes cold, they almost become lethargic. Yeah. And I'm not even talking like cold as in, wow, that. Like that's the alligators freezing. freezing yeah. in the water. Like I'm those saying pictures. like 26, 25 degrees. They already start becoming lethargic. Wow. That's, that's insane, actually. And you can keep them at 17 degrees. I don't know how people do it, but then that's, it's like a dead animal. Yeah. It it's doesn't not move doing anything. Much. It's literally wasting away. That That's sad. So temperatures, they're not obviously a big they're issue. Cold, they're cold tolerant. Yeah. But they not don't perform well. Okay. In cold temperatures. Well, I suppose they, they come from West Africa with the, the equator. So it's not, much of like a temperature change throughout the year. No, but we have wa- um, rainfall there. Okay. So that that's one of my tricks in breeding them. Okay. Uh, so um, I don't know if you want to go into that right now or a bit later. But yeah, we can go into that now. Okay, cool, cool, cool. I'm excited to tell you about that. <laughs> no, so don't I worry. Found, I found a trick um, okay. with breeding them. So in winter. Yeah. I, so wh- tell us what the winter months are for breeding here in South Africa. Okay, winter months for uh, South Africa is from March till, what, no, April. What do you say? Yeah, April, well, May, it starts going to autumn. Yes. And then we have June, July, August, September, it starts going into uh, spring. Yes. September. So I drop my temperatures to 28 in the winter. Okay, the water temperatures. The water temperatures. Yeah. And the basking and spot? Basking just... spot, I keep the same. Okay. So they've always got like a place to go and get warm if they want to. Okay. But I drop my water levels too. 
You drop your water levels. I drop my water levels because okay. there's no rain at that time, and these little puddles will go less and less. So the water, even though it's running at 28 degrees, yes, it's a lot cooler. Okay, well, well it's it, a lot cooler than 32 degrees. Celsius. Yeah, it's a lot cooler, but there's less water. Okay, so I drop it by at least half a foot. Okay, and sometimes a whole foot, and I don't put water in that enclosure for the whole of winter. These tricks are going to be so golden. Yeah, keep going. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't, I, I don't at all fill up my water. So if it evaporates slowly and slowly as the winter months go, I, sometimes I can go in there and the crocodile can't even submerge itself. And I okay. know it sounds cruel. Yes. But, but then most crocodilians like breed in the water. So wouldn't that be an issue? It would be an issue. So then as soon as we get those first rains. Okay. I'm okay, seeing where you're going. You flood your enclosure. Flooded, like you flooded, over. but what I do is I tie a sprinkler to the top. Okay. So of the it, greenhouse. Of the greenhouse. Yes. And it's not like I'm filling up the pond. I let it rain for two days straight. Wow. My family hates me because the water bill is ridiculous <laughs> out there. And it overflows the enclosure. Okay. And then you'll notice those nights where it's raining and storming. Yes. You'll hear the male uh, make this bellowing sound, which it's almost like a drum. Okay. So you'll go. Hum, 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 and do you hum. let let it rain fall like when it's raining outside because obviously raining outside, it's a yeah. greenhouse and you can't open so i'll do that whenever it rains okay even, even in the winter months if it's a slight drizzle i won't do it but the minute we have those big storms yes i i flood the enclosure so I barometric a, pressure has it has a to do massive with it. a massive indication oh well massive yeah yeah so then as for them copulating and that. So you've dropped the temperatures down. You keep them cool. Do you I keep, keep them cool in that time period. I don't raise my temperatures In yet. winter and that. Yeah. And then um, do you still keep the same feeding schedule and that? They, I do. However, they decide not to eat. Okay. So, so you I kind of offer every week, twice a week. Okay. But if they're not interested in feeding... I, you don't give it to them. I, well, I offer. If yeah. I don't want it, I take it away. Yeah. Okay, makes sense. So kind of give them the choice of if they need it, they'll take it. If they don't, they'll just whatever, leave yeah, it. Yeah, because their them. temperatures are still good enough to digest their food. Yeah. Well, it's still pretty hot. It's like yeah, 28, 28 degree. degrees. Is and like, like I say, when the water drops, it gets a little bit warmer. But because I'm running on the thermostat, it's always 28. Okay. And what are you using to keep the water so warm? So I've got a heat exchanger. Okay. What is that? Um. It's like a reverse aircon. So your okay. water goes in, it heats up, and then it pumps back out using. Um, rev- I don't actually know how the thing works, but, <laughs> but it, it, works, warms- it works pretty well. Like. <laughs> it helps them breathe and it, it keeps them alive, warms the water. It warms the water. So it's like a fan and it okay. sucks in air, and war- with that air, it somehow warms up <laughs> the water. <laughs> okay. And it's a lot cheaper because before I did that, I used jacuzzi heaters. Okay. And that was ridiculous. They were two kilowatts. That's a lot. Yeah. So it's two kilowatts and pulling that all the time to okay. heat the water was a mission and yeah. a half. So then, so you start cooling from about April. From April, yeah. Through till when? August. About August, okay. August. And they, do, they don't breed during this season? August, end of August. Okay. They start breeding as the rains come. So okay. I fill up my pond when that first rain comes and then... Flooded, flooded. Flooded, flood yeah, yeah, yeah. I flooded with the sprinkler on the top. Okay. And then I slowly raise my temperature by like a degree a day. Okay. And this is still August. And then, like I said, you'll hear this drumming sound late at night. It's normally like 9 o'clock to 12 o'clock, even 3 o'clock in the morning. Okay. And the male will go, hum, 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 hum. Okay. And then, so as it's starting to become spring. Spring, yeah. And um, that's indication he's ready to mate. He's calling for females. Okay. And occasionally I've walked in, caught them mating at okay. that time. But with that, they don't seem to mate during the rain. Not during the rain. Okay, Not so that kind of rain. stimulates It them stimulates him to call Okay. the next day after it's finished raining. So when it's dry... When it's dr- well, not dry, but when it's when it's uh, not raining. When it's not raining, yeah. so then that rain they just regenerate their water supply and all of that. And do they breed or copulate in the water? They copulate in the water. Okay, so obviously that's what I was saying. When the water level drops, obviously they don't breed in winter. Then so it doesn't matter because you've no, already the flooded the enclosure. Yeah. The water is back to its normal level, if not overflowing. Yeah. 
Okay. And the male will, like I said, this call thing is quite quite interesting because she responds. What does she respond with the same noise? No, she responds with a very loud Rawr, like sound. I know it sounds sound stupid here, but and then they mate. Okay, so in the same day, will like the male call out, then the female responds, Bonds, and then, and then mate. the next day they mate or what? No, no, during that call. Okay, so when try, she calls, when then she calls, it's like, then okay. it's an indication she wants to mate. Okay. To mate. And she'll swim around in nature yes. to other crocodiles. So a father, four to five males can sire a clutch. Oh, wow. So that's to get higher um, success, success with, rate yeah. with more viable sperm. Yes. So she'll go and travel and go to all different males. But what I noticed, and this is another trick. Yeah. I don't know if you want to know it. Okay, just go. Okay, we we go. need to know how to okay, breed these crocodilians. So Tom Crutchfield once uh, wrote a thing on Facebook saying that you need visual barriers to breed crocodiles. Okay, and I was I very remember confused that. about that. Like, why do you need visual barriers? Yes. But then with osteolamus, it made sense because I have these two dams inside the yes. pond initially. They would go and swim to the, the shallower one where the wall of the pond was higher. Okay. And they couldn't see anything out. So they thought they were secluded like an ostrich sticking its head in the ground. <laughs> yes. And then they'd mate there. And the mating lasted like 15 to 20 minutes. Okay. So they kind of want to feel safe and secure when secure. they are mating. Yes. So you've got to make sure there's like a high wall or... A visual you barrier. Want- you put logs, whatever, just so that they don't see you watching them or that they feel secure. Okay. So visual barriers are very important in breeding osteolamas. Okay. Even cave systems, like... Um, I suppose that's where they get it from. Yeah, most likely the cave systems, because you'll notice they'll go into the cave. Yes. Um, I have like an overhanging cave over my pond, and they'll go underneath that and mate there where they can't see out and you can't really see them in. Yes. You just see the tails curling. Wow, okay. And they'll mate in the water. How long does the copulation last? About 15 minutes to okay. 20 minutes, but then they'll lie next to each other for about an hour, just randomly. It's almost like cuddles. <laughs> and how often would they copulate after the rains? After every like Every time? third day or so, I'll catch, I'll catch them calling and the female responding and okay. mating. And they'll do that, obviously, until you, so, uh, when you keep flooding the enclosure with the big rains, do they keep copulating after that? Yes, for about a month. Okay. The male will continue to call though, but she stops responding. Okay, so she, so they'll breed from August through September. End of September, they'll stop they'll breeding. They'll stop, yeah. Okay. But your male will call all the way through to December, Jan. He won't. Okay, but to, she won't yeah, respond by she then. She won't respond. So then she falls gravid. Okay. And she'll, her, all of a sudden her appetite increases. Like you cannot believe she'll eat whatever you throw at her. And do you increase her diet then? I increase her diet. I put more calcium in it, more of those mice wraps in the bones. Okay. And anything else? Mm, let me think. <laughs> For a diet, I'm saying. For a diet. Yeah. So I do those rats mixed with the bones. So not twice a week. Now more to do like four times or three times a no, week? No, no. I just feed more in those those oh, periods okay, of okay. that. So my male, for some reason, he goes all food. Like okay. most snakes and that would do during the breeding yes. season. So he doesn't seem very interested in eating. But she increases. So she gets his share as well. So okay. it's from a kilogram, it'll go to like two kilograms, no one feed. Yeah. So she'll start eating a lot more at this time does she also bask then a lot more she basks yeah okay and um she'll bask a lot more sorry i'm gonna drink drink some water yeah sure have a have something to drink there we can't keep (laughs) talking without any lubrication for our mouth we've got to keep it so she'll bask a lot more yeah and she just becomes more aggressive as well. Okay. So her whole demeanor changes. She and does she still lie around with the male or? No, no. She starts going on her own mission. Okay. So she kind of wants, she to, wants like, to be hey, away boy, from it. Alone. Yeah. So she goes away. And you don't separate them at this time. I don't time. separate them. Um, but she'll start spending a lot more time out of the water, basking. If he comes near her, there's almost like a fight. Okay. So she becomes very aggressive, very territorial. Okay. And how is import, uh, how important is like flooding and rain in the enclosure during this period? Um, I miss the enclosure every third day then. Okay. With my misters, but I don't flood it after that. 
Okay. So unless there's a heavy rain. Okay, so only when there's a big big rain. But once they've copulated, I kind of stop with the flooding. Okay. Like once I then I know okay she's taken it because I my male's quite fertile. Okay, after the first copulation or after like they're done done when she stops calling. When she stops responding. Okay. I, s- I stop flooding and then I just keep my water level constant throughout that uh, okay, summery so period or spring period. And the temperatures now back up to normal or uh, not they yet? go to thirty two okay. straight away, and then I decide. I'll notice she's walking around, doing scratching around. Okay. And I realize I need to put in more nesting material. Okay. So and that will be like when? What That'll months? be September. September. End of September or so? Halfway through about. Okay. So you put in all the um, leaf litter you get, grass cuttings, compost. I make, I get straw and yes. lucerne from like the pet stores for the guinea pigs and that. Okay. And I mix it all up and I take a spade and I shovel it and more compost on top of that. And then she'll come and inspect that area. So you've got to like layer up a big mound a for A big her. mound that's going to rot. Okay. And, it, and it's going to cause a lot of heat inside the enclosure. Yes. Because it's all this rotting material. So and does it actually like bring up the ambient temperature It brings up the ambient temperature as well. As well. Yeah. Okay. To about like what? I would say my ambient temperature sits at like 34 in the day in the mid-afternoon. Okay. Like when I remember conscious. spending some time last year building the nest with you. It got pretty... Pretty sweltering in there, I must admit, especially higher up on the rocks in the enclosure there. Yeah. And during this time, would they ever climb up there? They would, the female would. Still, um, even though it's like cooking hot, basically. Hot, yeah. So she'll bask with her mouth open, you know, she'll just sit there just basking. Okay. So w- what are the nesting materials you use? So I use straw. Okay. And in any sort of order, like how do you layer it or does it I put matter? sawdust down first. Okay. Um, that's just to initiate a rotting okay. cycle because the sawdust rots the quickest. Okay. And then I put some compost over that, which is just normal compost you buy from the gardening shops. Okay. And then I put straw. Yeah. And then I put more sawdust and I just create a rotting pile. But How with, big must this pile be? Normally about a meter in diameter. Okay. And I would make it like three foot high to a meter high. Wow, that's that's quite big. How's she gonna get up there? She climbs up there. She she does it, and she'll also add material herself. Okay. So if I got plant matter on the other side of the pond, yes, she'll swim there, grab it with her mouth, and plonk it onto the mound. That's so cool. So she builds it, and then she'll stick her nose in the mound. Yes. And she'll check um the temperature is not good. Oh wow. And then she swims in away the, in the center of the mound, or just sticking her nose into like the side of the mound. Okay. So she'll stick it in, she'll check, and then she'll go away. Then normally September, October time, end of September, October, Okay. she starts spending a lot more time around the mound, shuffling the soil, mixing it up herself, okay. putting more stuff in there. She'll even like carry stuff in her mouth, which is quite phenomenal for me. Yeah. You know, it's phenomenal. A crocodile, like with crocodilians known as like the creatures with the highest bite force being so gentle and like picking plants to put on. Yeah, nest. pretty much. So she'll pick these plants and she'll put on the mound. Yeah. And then just all of a sudden one yeah. night I'll catch her on top of the mound. Okay. And she'll do this for about like a week. Yeah. She'll go every night and just sit there for like 12 hours, like from about five o'clock in the afternoon Okay. to six o'clock in the morning. She'll sit on top of this mound. No eggs deposited, nothing. Okay. Just sit there. Like kind of feeling... Okay, feeling the temperature. This might be the right place to lay. Okay. Like that's what I assume she. So that's why doing. you got to make sure the mound is set up prior and already started to rot. Yeah. That so that's how many months after copulation there. So if it's copulating throughout August, you say? Yeah. And then end of September, October, she starts, she starts doing this checking. on the Okay. Mound. That's why you got to... Kind of when they just stopped copulating you at the this, mound. The mound. Okay. Yeah. And then this is the tricky part. If she's not happy with that mound, she almost becomes egg bound. Okay. But she's so, swelling at this time. She's yeah. getting bigger. So I don't know if it's egg bound or she's just waiting for this mound to be perfect temperature. So I don't know the gestation period okay. of how long she carries those eggs for. I've had her lay... If my mound was perfect, I've had her lay straight away. Okay. After like a week of sitting on top of the mound, she'll deposit her eggs. I've also had her then all of a sudden December, January lay eggs. 
So that's like quite a few months later. Later, and she copulated the same time. And do you think rainfall has anything to do with it? Because last year, I don't remember us having... We had really late rains. We had very late rains, and she laid quite early last year. Was it last year she... Yeah. When did she lay her last clutch? Her last clutch was laid... I've got to go through the months now. Oh, yeah, it was... I remember, yeah, yeah, sorry. The year before, she took a really long time. She took a long long time. time. She laid in January. Yeah, that was not fun for us waiting. No, no, it wasn't at all. So she laid in January. And do you think that's because the mound... I think the mound wasn't sufficient. Okay, and did so you she do held anything them in. to... I also had some people from a film crew come and they wanted to film her nesting. Yeah. And I think that disturbed her a lot. So she okay. wasn't happy with the location nor the yes. um, the mound. So you kind of got to... When she stops, starts laying on the mound, you got to kind of leave her alone. Yeah, you leave her alone. You don't open that cage, that enclosure. Okay. You spend less time doing that. And still feeding? Still feeding normal. She'll stop, like, eating at this time. Okay. Uh, she'll just go off food. But I think it's because she can't fit the food in her. Because if I show you a picture, I'll send them to you for the... Yeah. Yeah. Um, she she swells up quite a lot. Like she so balloons they look, almost. They look like a swollen little crocodile type yeah, of thing. Yeah, and if you touch them, you can actually feel eggs inside her. Wow, that's in incredible. those osteoderms, like on the side of her body. Yeah, you just feel that. You can feel these little lumps. Wow, and that that that's the eggs. That's that's quite something to experience, especially because this is such a rare species that. Not many have bred in captivity, and I can't say many people really even know how, because the amount of people who ha- who even own such animals is pretty far and few between. Yeah, so it's mainly like institutes, and I think this is the problem in South Africa. Most yeah. people that actually have the osteolamus yeah. are these big farms and facilities, and they treat them just like a Nile. Okay. There's no tricks that they're doing to them. So the temperatures, obviously, with Niles, Niles can handle a lot colder temperatures. Temperatures, and it's also it's more basic animal to breed. Yes, it's you, it's not like uh, with the Osteolamus, you have to do a bunch of things. You just kind of plop the Niles together. Not exactly, but yeah. So you just make sure you've got your sand pits because yeah. they 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 diggers. And we do it. We we they are bred here in South Africa because they actually occur here. So yeah, so they, they match in with our yes. ecosystem ways. You're looking at a tropical species and all yes. these farms are treating them like a sub-Saharan <laughs> species. <laughs> exactly. Doesn't so. kind of make sense. But then when she lays the eggs, it's quite interesting because she'll dig for like two days okay. in the mound. And normally she'll dig late at night, like 12 o'clock at night. And then one day I'll just walk into the enclosure yeah. while she's been digging for this last like three days. So does she just make the hole deeper and deeper? No, or? she'll cover it up again and again and again. She just like muddles in there. She, like she okay. shuffles the sand Interesting. and everything. And then she's normally, this is about 11 o'clock at night yes. to one o'clock in the morning as she does this. Then with the day she lays, I will know she's going to lay. Okay. She comes out at five o'clock. In the afternoon. Yes. And by 8 o'clock at night, she's already laying eggs. So she, she re-digs the, the nest, nest again. Again, and lays really early. Wow. In so comparison to what she's been doing. So normally 9 o'clock at night, she's out there shuffling the sand. If she's out at 5 o'clock already shuffling the sand, I you know, know that that's the day. That's the day you're getting some bang. <laughs> yeah. So, and then she'll cover that up. And okay. she'll make the mound even bigger and shape it the way she wants it. So add more stuff on top Add of more the mound. stuff on top. She'll wet it even because my pond's there. She will kick water into the mound. Okay, so that's another thing that people should probably know. So you kind of got to make the mound or, or, sorry, the mound, the nesting materials available near the water because it seems like she's going to lay near the water if she's kicking yes. water up. Yeah, she's kicking water up, so... Normally, what I imagine in nature and from the articles I have read where they found mounds, okay, it's always under a hollow of a tree that makes a cave oh, okay. system into the water. Okay, so very close to the water. To water Obviously, systems. if the babies hatch, got to get got to get the them to the water as fast as possible, so no little bugs or whatever eat them because they're such tiny little crocs. Yes, 
And so she'll lay those eggs and then I'll raid the nest. Okay. The next day, following day. Like okay. I don't waste any time. So th- she lays it before 8 p.m. or so. Mm. And then you know, okay, tomorrow early morning I'm going to raid, raid the nest. nest. Okay. So she covers that up and she makes this mound huge. She messes up the entire enclosure. <laughs> my filters in my pond are clogged because <laughs> she even digs up dirt. Okay. From either side of the enclosure to make her mound even bigger. It can stand like a meter and a half high that night. That's incredible because obviously all the materials um, started to decompose and it kind of gets squished, squished and now she builds it back up again. She builds it huge. And then she becomes super, super, super protective and aggressive. Does she lay on the mound? She lays on the mound. She'll sit there the whole time. Okay. She's on top of that mound and she sits there. Then when I go into raid, I normally chase her back into the water, open up the mound, and now the eggs are found in the center of the mound. Yes. Now, I've had trouble finding what temperature to incubate the eggs at. Okay. So I looked into it, and I decided to take a temp gun, you know, those little... Yes, like, yeah. Beep, beep. <laughs> beep, beep, take, check the temperature. And I open up the mound, and I check the temperature of the eggs, and I'm shocked how hot it is. Because yeah. if you read up on the incubation in that book that I said, that guy yes. hatched them out at 28 degrees. 28. That, that's colder than Niles, if I'm right. Yeah, it is. And Niles, you'll normally incubate at 32 to 34. Yes. Well, they say 28, 29 is like yeah. the, the starting temps. But then normally the farms incubate them at 33 degrees to produce more males and hatch them out quicker. Okay. So then... If it, what is what is this like golden temperature that you found out in the in the mound? Yeah, it didn't help me at all. What was it though? It was thirty four degrees. Oh, well, I suppose it's also it's like be- super hot, but I think that's because I've got them in an enclosure. Okay, so you think it's hotter than they should be? I think it's hotter than they should be, so that didn't help. So I incubate at twenty nine degrees in the hopes that what I hatch will be half male, half female. Okay, so that's a golden ratio, like golden temperature. Yeah, so they are temperature sex determined. Yes. So the hotter you have it, the more males. Okay. And the cooler you have it, more females. Okay. But they say there's a certain stage with Niles have tested this. Yes. That halfway through your temperatures, if your temperatures are 30, let's say 33. Yeah. You're more chance of getting a male. Yes. But 33.3. Yeah. You could switch back to females. What? Yeah, there's just a whole like, article on that. That makes no sense. Yeah. It's kind of also incredible. like a crocodile. They say sex is determined at two weeks of incubation. Okay, but then there's another period just after that where it can change back. That that's so interesting to think about. So generally, higher temperatures induce males and lower temperatures females. Yet if it's like 33 on the cusp of males, and then you go to 33.3, you, it can switch to females. Female, again, That's halfway through mad. incubation. That's mad. So it's not like once it's male, it's definite male in the egg. Wow. There's, there's two chances to swap. <coughs> two Have chances something to, to drink. swap. You can keep it up, yeah. Cool. There's two chances to swap the temperature of the, I mean, the sex of the animal. Wow, that's... That is really insane. I I didn't even know that. Where do you find all these articles? <laughs> no, no, seriously. That was on, um, I think it's actually in that book. Oh, wow. Crocodilian. Okay, yeah. so it's been out there. It's or been, been out known there for a while. while. Okay. Yeah. I didn't know about it. Also, you can go to these croc, uh, I know croc fest and all of that. In, in the or, US, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they discuss all this stuff as well. That's incredible. So any more tips you have for, before we go into incubation, um, any more tips on like getting the, everything ready so you have successful babies? So your temperatures in the enclosure obviously play a big role. Your yes. mound plays a big role and the flooding. Okay, so you think the flooding is one of the biggest? I think flooding is one of the biggest and also those visual barriers so that okay. they can mate and feel secure when they're mating. Okay, that makes sense. And then do that, is it important for them to have like a space that they can get away from each other? Well, in my old enclosure, I had the two ponds, but then when I redid the, I did one huge pond. But I think it's because okay. they're so used to each other now. And okay, so it'll probably be best for pairs that don't know each, each other, other to, to be have two ponds. Okay, 
And then maybe like a big visual barrier in between the in pond the, as well. In between the pond, yeah. And then as far as depth for the pond, does that make a big impact? Yes. So, sorry. Yeah, I completely <laughs> forgot that fact. So crocodiles must be able to stand on their back legs with their heads out of the water. That's the depth that they like to mate at. Okay. Wow. I didn't know that. That's, that's some golden info right yeah. there. Even with your Niles and your other species, that, that's very important. Because when your male sits on top of your female, he can drown her. Okay. So she must be able to... So then they mate for a while because obviously they can hold their breath. For... Well, he pushes her underneath the water. That's okay, a... so she's like breathing out and he pushes down, down and he's like, oh, help, he... help. Yeah. <laughs> so that mating of 20 minutes, 15 minutes, I don't know because crocodiles can blast underneath water for hours. Yes. But if she feels distressed, at least she's got a way of popping up again. Okay, so... So as long as her back legs can touch the water. And then I notice he doesn't push her out. She'll stand up on her back legs. Okay. And he'll stand behind her with the back legs, curl the tails. Okay. And... Copulate, yeah. Copulate, yeah. Wow, okay. So the water depth is also obviously a big importance then. Yeah, so water depth, I keep my water in the deeper section at one... 1.2 meters. Okay. And the shallowest section I've got is about... 600, was 600, it? 600, yeah. Okay. So with my old pond, when I had the two ponds, the one was 1.2 meters deep and the other one was only 30 centimeters, 40 centimeters deep. Okay. And that worked as well. Okay, so, so they need... And they tend to breed, uh, you said previously, on the shallower side where the visual barrier was. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting. So, and the temperatures then are back up to 34 degrees or 32. 32 degrees in the water. Okay. And then outside still a little bit cooler than summer or not? Um, yeah, it's cooler just purely because I've got one basking spot and not creating an ambient um, increase. So okay. my basking spot stays on throughout the, the year. So as the temperatures outside increase my temperatures inside also increase. Okay. So now going on to collecting the eggs in that, any tips for getting the female off of the mound? So I literally walk in with a, a asbestos sheet. Okay. And I chase her into the water. She's very Like aggressive. a big shield. Like a big shield, yeah. And she's very aggressive. She jumps, she attacks, she does whatever she wants to, okay. to get you away from her mound. Yes. Now I decided I don't want her to think I've, stolen her eggs so i yes. thought that that shield i don't use a see-through shield okay it's asbestos so she can't see through it yes once she's blocked i raid the mound yes I put the eggs inside a bucket okay and then i cover the obviously mound. don't turn the eggs over or anything not really no okay but i've got 24 hours to do that okay yeah so because the embryo hasn't attached, hasn't attached yet yeah. so then um i chase her and i put the mound back together okay so I put it back up. Yes. And I build it up again. Kind of like how she had it. How she had it. So and you try to make as little destruction to the nest as possible. Yes, because I'm I'm just curious. Well, not curious. I'm just concerned. She sees her mound is destroyed and then never wants to breed again. Okay. Well, that has happened in the past where you saw how she like almost looked depressed when she you raided the mound. She almost seemed depressed when I left the mound destroyed. Yeah. That's incredible because crocs do seem to have this connection with their young. Like I've seen even West African crocodiles at, I think it was the Bronx Zoo or something like that. They sent, uh, posted a video, not sure where. Where they bred them in that greenhouse. I'm not, and the mother looked after the yes, young. And she was kind of like tearing the egg off and gently yeah. holding the babies. Yeah. So obviously they have a connection. There is that maternal instinct. Yes. yes which is fascinating. So you try and not mess that up you by try not disturb it so every year i feel bad because she's yes. not getting to see her babies yeah and i'm always so scared she's going to just stop breeding because she's she like, feels like it's pointless yeah i suppose so but then again they are clever so they may think okay i i've had no success hatching these babies so let's keep trying yeah that, that could be manner. but we don't know i suppose we don't know it's just like it's human compassion that's making me think that yes but we don't know for sure what the But you can is. kind of see, as you said earlier, they have personalities. So you can see she's looking depressed. You've taken her babies away. You've and destroyed the mound. She knows it. She'll stop protecting the mound from that moment. So then when you keep the mound like as is, 
Does she still protect she it protects once it. you've raided? She, she looks after that mound. She'll still add material and remove wow. material depending on temperature. Shame, you must feel so bad for that. <laughs> like, all that work for nothing. <laughs> Shame. So she'll still add material and remove material from the mound to check temperature to keep it, like, constant. So she has a higher success rate. Okay. So she'll carry on doing that all the way till February okay. the next year. So she'll wait and wait and wait. And then February, she just... That's quite a few months of just waiting. And does yeah. she spend some time in the water she'll during She'll spend some period? time in the water as, as the months go by. Okay. So, like, February, she'll spend more time in the water. Okay. And so then she'll just When it's like caring. end of incubation period yeah. type of thing, she'll, she'll know. She'll know. And then she'll just stop caring about the mound. Okay. So does she like test the temperatures in the mound during this time? Yes. She'll go and like stick her okay. nose in and check the temperature and then either add material or remove it. And when she removes it, she'll get yeah. on top of the mound and just kick material away. And mess up your pond system. Yeah. Again. <laughs> Putting it in the water. The filters. <laughs> Um, so then once you raided the eight, the nest, how many eggs do you get roughly? Normally it's 10 to 12, sometimes okay. 15 if you're lucky. So not a huge It's not clutch. a massive clutch. And um, then... But the eggs are almost the same size as Nile eggs. Wow. So... So it's a smaller clutch, but the eggs are bigger. Yeah. So obviously it's the world's smallest crocodile, not crocodilian, um, and they still have like egg sizes... Close to the world's largest crocodile. Yeah. Your Niles. Well, they're not your largest, but they one of. Yeah. The salty is the biggest, but still, that's incredible. So those eggs are the same. And then the babies are born the same size, just a little bit smaller than a Nile. Okay. They so, they kind of look like a little bulldog with their Yeah, nose. they've got like a squashed face. It's yeah, almost, it's so it's, cute. It's cute. It's like caiman face almost, like spectacle caiman. So yeah. Very, very true. broad and pushed in face. Yeah, it's so cute when they hatch. And then it obviously over times time changes up a bit um as for like after you've you've raided it okay. now your incubator what yeah. how's your incubator set up so my incubator i try and copy like the the farms do so okay. they have these walk-in incubators with water on the floor a fan on the floor yes to keep that high humidity. humidity and then they've got shelving yeah with the eggs and polystyrene boxes with holes punctured in the box okay all over, full of vermiculite, and the eggs piled in the exact same position that you found them. That you found them in. How important do you think that is? I don't know. To be honest, they say in twenty four hours, if you've got twenty four hours to raid them to get the eggs, okay. embryo hasn't attached yet, so you can roll the egg and do whatever you want with it. Yeah, but. I still think it pays a big charm. So, like, if you find eggs on top of each other, do you try keep... You try keep that egg on top, on top of another egg. Okay. So, you kind of and replicate also, it. There's, there's studies showing that they communicate through the eggs. Oh, wow. So, they so need to be close they together. They need to be touching. Okay. The eggs need to be touching always. So, last year, I tried this technique of where I put the eggs like snake eggs. Yes. In a rows next to each other, but touching. Yes. But no eggs on top. Okay. And I didn't have success because my incubator, but... The babies develop perfectly. And okay. My incubator bombed out. Obviously, I never hatched out those. those so, young. so now you think it's better. So the previous way you like kind of burying the eggs. I buried in the egg vermiculite. on top of the egg, on top of the egg, and then made these pyramids, like how she laid it. Okay. And it worked. Yes. But I feel it's not necessary. And you can't check the eggs. Also, then I feel. Yeah. And so if one egg goes off and it uh, contaminates the other eggs, you're stuffed. Okay, so so you would recommend it's best to separate them out, separate kind them of all like next snake to, eggs. Yes, and then you can see which ones are going off, and you can monitor the banding. So when a crocodile egg, all crocodiles do it. Okay. So when they lay the egg, yeah, it's like an opaque, almost like white. Yes. Oh. <laughs> Little uh. Cape Cobra, hooding at us. <laughs> so it's almost like just a light white yes. color. Yes. And then after about 24 hours, you'll notice a little dot appears on the egg. A very okay. white, 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 white dot. Okay. And that's where the embryo is attached to the egg. And then as the egg develops, that little white dot will band around the egg. It'll make like a circle around okay. the egg. And you can't see veins at this time? You can't see veins at all. Okay. That's, so it kind of looks like an infertile egg if you candle it. Yeah, it's just yellow and then with a reddish spot. Okay. On there, but it's not like veins or anything. It's just like 
it's almost like you can't see through it. Okay, so sometimes like if you take the egg out straight away and you candle it, it and it's like yellow inside, that doesn't mean it's infertile, right? No. Oh no. wow, interesting. So the minute that that they say if the egg doesn't band, okay, then it's infertile. Yes. So when you candle those eggs just after they hatch, they'll be yellow inside. Nothing. Well, not well, after they lay, not hatch. Oh, I mean, sorry, yeah, after they lay. <laughs> yes. So they'll be white and then yellowish on the inside with no, it just looks like liquid inside. Okay. And then as that band grows, that little dot. Okay. How, notice, how long does it take again to get that dot? 24, 24 hours. 24 hours. Okay. So On the top where the embryo is. Yes. Okay. And then that grows and grows and grows. And then eventually when you candle it at, let's say, two weeks, yeah, you'll see that has made like a pink band around the egg where you can't really see through the egg okay a pink band not a white band well no 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 the egg on the t- out is okay. white but when you candle it okay. it's pink so you can't really see it like it's yes. almost blocking the light okay and that grows and eventually it takes over the whole egg and then if you candle it you'll see that veins are starting to develop from that point of the dot yes and it takes over the whole whole egg wow. and okay. then eventually you can't see through the egg and then it's just like this one solid one solid thing and you band. can sort of see like slight veins or whatever. Okay. That's when the does, egg is almost ready to hatch. Oh wow. How long does that take for like the banding to start from the dot to get all the right way around the egg? So that's about 48 hours to okay. go around and then to take over the whole egg is about 69 to 70 days. Okay. So 75 about, days. About 48 hours after she's laid, then you you know if the eggs are fertile, fertile or, or infertile. Not. Would you still try with infertile eggs I just would, in case? I would, I um, would, just in case. But normally after about two weeks, if you candle them, you'll see okay. the, the yellow inside. Is and then thing. how do you know if the eggs are like starting to rot and potentially contaminating the so rest the of the So the egg clutch? goes like blue. Okay. Eventually it goes blue. And then you take that thing you out of You take there. it out and you throw it away. That was the problem with my whole pyramid scheme. It didn't work so well because one okay. egg in the sensor would go blue. I couldn't be able to see it or remove it. Yes. And slowly contaminate the other eggs around it. Okay. So you don't want it. That's why you don't set it up as her nest basically. But yeah. you keep the eggs touching each other. Touching so each other so like the, the communication between embryos can continue. Wow. That's, that's incredible. And then your temperatures, let's touch on that again. Okay. So temperatures for egg incubation, I do a 28.9. Okay. And that's just purely because I want more girls than boys, but okay, I also so want what, to split. What's the range you can use? The range you can use is from 28. Okay. To about 31, 32. Okay. From 32 up with West Africans, you start killing your eggs. Okay. So they're overheating. Oh wow! Even even though that mound was like thirty four, that's that, that's why I said like when I measured that mound, I was so confused. Cause yes, because they weird. weren't hatching. And then here in South Africa, when Saint Lucia um, Croc Farm was still breeding the Osteolamus years yes. ago, they hatched out only males because they were hatching them at the same temperatures they were doing Niles, and that shocks me as well that they didn't wow. lose all those eggs. Yes, because their temperatures were so hot. Well, now. There's like a flood of males everywhere, and that that's obviously why because they could only produce males back then. Yeah. Okay, interesting. And then, as for humidity, do you just humidity? We keep just like a Nile crocodile, so okay. you you want it in the eighty ninety region. Okay, so kind of like your snake eggs. Do kind of like your snake eggs, or a bit more. When you mix your vermiculite or your yes. perlite, you make sure it's sopping. Okay. And then you squeeze oh, it out, dripping. Then if you squeeze it at least four drops of water must come out of that vermiculite. Okay. So you squeeze it, one, two, three, four. If like it streams out, you know it's too wet. Okay. But if four drops come out as you squeeze it, okay, it's good. You put that in, you bury your eggs halfway. Okay. And oh, so half of the egg buried in the vermiculite. Half the egg buried in the vermiculite. Okay. And then you just wait. And you have a lid on the tub. You, that have, you have. I do the polystyrene box still, even okay. though I'm doing it differently to the croc farms by okay. not piling the eggs and laying them out. Yes. I still put in a polystyrene box with holes punctured in it. So they can breathe. So the eggs can breathe. And my incubator sets up just, it's it's a fridge, okay. but it's the same as what the croc farms use. So I put like a wet towel on the floor, okay. a little fan at the bottom yes. to circulate the air and keep the humidity up. Okay, nice. And I wet that towel. Every every like four days, I open my incubator and I wet that towel. Okay. Eventually, water starts dripping from the top of the incubator. 
Yeah. And I know that's a good temperature. Like if there's water driplets on the top of my incubator, I know it's doing well. And you don't you don't want that on your eggs, do you? No, no, no. You don't want that on your eggs, but they cover it in the polystyrene box. So I cover the box completely. Okay, but in the box, doesn't it have the same condensation where the driplets form on you the can, top of the you lid? You do have that sometimes, but then you can cover up your eggs with moss, like sphagnum moss. On top? On top of the eggs. Ah. So that when water driplets come and touches the moss and doesn't touch your eggs. Okay, and then you can easily move the moss to, to, to get check to your on the eggs. eggs. Yeah. Okay, and how often do you open up the eggs for oxygen or check on them? So I open up my incubator three or four times a week okay. just to monitor a temperature and get like new air in there. Yes. So that's how much I do it. Nice. And then how many days... Once you've put them in the incubator, how long does it take for them to start hatching? So we're looking at 78 to 85 days. Okay. Yeah. And if it goes a little bit longer, should it you start It can go worried? to like 110 days. Hectic. It <laughs> can go the weight too. must kill. But normally if your temperatures are set at 29, 30. Okay. You're going to hatch them out in 78 to 85 days. Um, And then... How do you, once the babies start hatching, is there any specific care for those guys? Like you don't want to shock them and put them in a cold tub no, or no, something? No, no, no. So what you do, as soon as they've hatched out the egg, okay. if the embryo is fine and the, like I've said, I had problems with hatching. A lot of them are born with their stomachs outside of their bodies. Their yolk sac not absorbed. Wow. And what is I think it was that? my humidity. Too low and or too temperature high? fluctuation. Okay. So my humidity was too high and my temperatures were not constant. So it would fluctuate. Even slight okay. fluctuation was terrible, apparently. That's weird because I don't know. How, how would it stay super constant, constant sorry, in, in the, the wild? She removes and adds on material to keep it that constant. Oh, wow. Because she's constantly checking. checking and so you want to, it's not like snake eggs where they can have a bit of fluctuation. Fluctuation. You want it constant throughout the whole incubation. Wow. Because she's actually being a good mom and constantly testing the temperatures. That's so interesting. So, yeah. So then um, when they hatch, they'll call from the egg. Okay. Now, a lot of the time they struggle to get out of that egg. So the mother would come and help them and like open up the mound and crack the egg and let the babies out. Yes. Yeah, so but that's seeming that she's turn. not with it. Now, now I have to do that. So you have to be the mommy. <laughs> so the minute they crack that, that, that um, egg. egg and they start calling, you go and you crush the egg slightly. Okay. All of but, them. Well, no, the ones that are calling. Okay. And normally if you leave the egg, the baby that's hatched first yes. in the nest with the other eggs, it'll stimulate them all to start hatching yeah, at the same call time. Does. Yeah. So then, then okay. you just check and you crush each egg. And then you allow them out. So you wait for them all to hatch before you remove them. Yes. Then what you do is you put them in like um, Dettol and Savlon. Yes. Water. Very slight dilution. Okay. So that's an antiseptic. Yeah. Yeah. An antiseptic. You just put them in a little bath with lukewarm water mixed with Savlon. Okay. You put them in there for about five minutes or so just to get rid of any other stuff. Okay. Like, what? I like bacteria or something they could have had from the moss or anything. Okay. You clean them up. You and could you use like F10 or something? You could use F10, yeah. Okay, perfect. So it's just to clean them off to yeah. give them a better And then chance. you put them back in the incubator. So what temperature would that water be? Because obviously it's normally you about want a slight 20, dilution Yeah, too. so about 26 to 28. Okay, so colder than colder the adults. Colder than the adults. Yes. So I don't know. I don't really... Me- Keep it the same way as the adults. Okay. I just do lukewarm water and let them just swim around a bit. Okay. It gets How them deep? swimming. Uh, five centimeters. Okay. So they can kind of still walk. They can on walk it. in the water. So it's just okay. enough to walk and. Walk and swim at the same time. Yeah. So it strengthens them. Um, yeah. And it makes them capable of swimming. You can see if there's any problems as well. Like if a baby starts like swimming on its side and. What do you do yeah. then? Well, then that baby has got a problem, so you just have to check what the problem is. Okay. So then you put them back in the incubator for 24 hours. And this is okay, trick once I, you've, click, uh, once you've cleaned them, them. So you put them with dry vermiculite okay. back in the incubator. Do you dry them off first? Cause you dry them off first. The vermiculite will obviously stick sticks to, to them. them. You put them in a polystyrene box or whatever. In the incubator? In the incubator with 
breathing holes and that for another 24 hours. Okay. This is a trick I learned from the crocodile farms because when they're born, they have where the umbilical cord is. Yes. It's sometimes not sealed completely. Yeah. So if you keep them at that temperature, it closes up quickly and the okay. scarring isn't so bad. Oh, but wow. I noticed it also gives them a chance to like get stronger. Oh, wow. Yeah, obviously, because it's the higher temperature and they, they can just chill in there, boosting their immune system, system with that High Absorbing heat. that last bit of yolk okay. and all of that. Then after that 24 hours, I'll put them in a meat tray. Okay. It's a, <laughs> They're not being used for food, obviously. No, no, no. <laughs> like a meat tray of um, it's an empty tub, like yes. 50 liter tub. Yes. I'll put two bricks in the center. Okay. With a little caging... Uh, like mesh on top. Yes. Water about three or four centimeters deep. Okay. A little water heater. Basking lamp above the bricks. Yes. And I put all the babies in there. All together. All together. And what what temperature is the water the at? The water, I set that to about 32 again. Okay. So now it's up to a higher temperature. Higher temperature. It. And I've put my basking spot on and I let them in there. Okay. When and you then, introduce them to the water, do you just plop them I in the water? I just pop them in the okay. water. And they'll do their own thing. Okay. And then I'll feed about a day later after that. Okay, what do you feed them? So you feed crickets, things that are moving, because they're not going to take like dead food straight away. They have no idea what it is. Oh, okay. Well, they're babies. They're yeah. Like, their natural instinct is to get something that's moving. Moving, yeah. yeah. So you throw in some crickets, you throw in some giant mealworms, things like that. Okay. They'll bite it, they'll eat it. In the water. In the water. Yeah. And then you can start introducing like piles of meat or like they'll cut chicken pieces okay with calcium with or? calcium dip or you just leave it with that crocodile powder that i get from the farms okay. in a pile and they'll go and eat that and then eventually you can start training them like, okay to nice. come when you call and take food off the tweezers and are you like keen that. to talk about training or yeah we can talk about it okay, so you when you start feeding your crocodiles yes um you make a call like i have a click sound you just okay. go and every time you feed them you make that click sound Okay. Before you give them the food. Okay. So it gets their attention and lets them know that food is coming. Yes. And then normally after about a month of doing that, yes. automatically you make that click sound. They're all going to turn around and be like, <laughs> oh, food time. Okay. So that's what you do. Yeah. So they're pretty intelligent. And then like, I know you've trained some of yours to come when you call them by name. How do you get that from the click sound? So what you do is you hold food. You okay. make the click sound. Yeah. Now they're ready, ready to eat. Yes. So you don't give it to them. You call them by name and you show them the meat. And so you, you first give the click sound and then you... And then you give the name that you want to call it. Okay. And you wiggle the food in front of them yes. until they come towards you. Then you say their name again. Okay. And then you give the food and you make a click sound. Okay. The click sound then purely is to show them they can eat. Okay. The name sound is to come. Oh, wow. Interesting. Okay. So you never... Say you stick your hand in and you go... Yeah. Then they're going to bite your hand because <laughs> they think it's food. Okay. So if you make that to get their attention. Yes. And then you call them by name and then you go and that's eating. Okay. Interesting. That's that's really good. And is there any other tricks that you can think of uh, to help people breeding osteolamus? Or is we think Don't give up. <laughs> Don't give up. If you have a pair, try your best to to breed them. Okay. In that sense, and keep you keep your temperatures high, and okay. most of the year. Yeah. And flood your enclosure. I that is that is the trick that I think a lot of people do not do, and I think that's the only reason people aren't breeding them. They seem like an easier species for me. Okay. As long as you flood that enclosure, it just and then stimulates incubation them. is seems a little I, bit more tricky. Incubation is my tricky part. Okay. Well, this has been amazing, bro. There's so much information that you've spilled and shared with us i'm sure so many people would be like incredibly grateful thank you so much for being no the first guest on my podcast is there any social medias out there that you want the people to follow you well on? you guys if you want you can follow crocoholics conservation center on instagram yes so also privately i okay. make t-shirts yeah um, dope t-shirts yeah, check it this crocoholics got crocoholics t-shirts and i have the norm wild yes which sells like um we we produce shirts that are very reptile related yeah. a lot of the stuff you see me wearing is from izzy here and a lot of that money that i use for that because it's a part-time like business for me i use to help me with the 
the crocodilians yeah. buy food and all of that. So if okay. you guys want, go follow those social media pages, The Norm Wild and Crocolix Conservation Center. Check out the cool stuff. And do you ship internationally we for the shirts? We ship internationally for the shirts, everything. Awesome. And, so and we have a website really as well, uh, www.thenormapparel.co.za. Awesome. Sweet, bro. Anything else? Uh, any other social medias? TikTok, what? Yeah, no, you can follow <laughs> me on TikTok, but that's just for fun. Okay, but sweet. if you really want to follow uh, the Crocoholics Conservation Center and on what Facebook. we're doing, Facebook and Instagram is the best bet. Yeah. And I'm sure you'll keep everyone up to date there with the success you're going to have this year, hopefully, with breeding these species. Yes, yes, yes. Let's Before we end, sorry. Do you want to just tell other people like what other crocodilians you're currently working with? So I have Trigonatus, uh, Palatucus Trigonatus I'm working with. Yes, I and have, that's your... That's your Schneider's Dwarf Cayman or yes. Smooth Fronted Cayman. I have Palatucus Pulpabrosus. Your curvier's dwarf caiman. I have Mr. Stops Cataphractus, your African slender snouted crocodile. Something that Bryce is very jealous of. <laughs> and then I have the Osteolamus. Uh, Which Bryce is even more jealous of. Yeah. Yeah. And I'd like to get Cubans, but it's, it's, it's a Work challenge. But we're going to grow the Crocoholics Conservation <laughs> Center until it's eventually a well known facility that's yes. helping with conservation. Well, we, we definitely aren't going to end this here as far as podcasts. You are definitely going to come on in the future because there's so much information that you have to share. So thank you for so much for everything that you've shared with us. And I, I really love that your goal is conservation and not the monetary value behind these rare animals. You just want to, you just love them I so much. I just want more. I just exactly. want more in the world. Exactly. You have nothing. You don't care about the money. Obviously you need the money to run the facility and if, keep them. If the bred. norm could bring the money in to fund crocoholics, I wouldn't sell. And I had the space. I wouldn't sell any crocodiles. I would trade them for other crocodiles yeah. for new bloodlines to keep this program going. So you think that's important also keeping the di genetic diversity there? Yes, yes. They're definitely important because if you start keeping like inbreeding to a certain extent, you're going to get problems and the bloodline is going to be really, really, really you're bad. Push it up, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, bro. I really appreciate this. No issue. And thank you for having me. It's really awesome to, to have done this. And I, You did really well, bro. I'm, thanks. I was a bit nervous. I won't lie. Yeah, well, you did amazing. <laughs> I, I appreciate all the information you've shared with us thank you again that's it bryce from animals everywhere and check me out on righteous reptiles on youtube i don't know Plug check him us. out he's pretty cool <laughs> check his tiktok page that's really cool no 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 <laughs> that's weird <laughs> jokes cheers guys